Hey, this is Steve Sherman on location with the Power of Process segment. I'm going to finish up my talk on uh, the view camera and its operation. We're actually going to do a demo right here in Hartford uh, Graffiti Park. First part I want to go over is with a view camera, you have the option of rising the lens. You can see the building far off in the distance. We want to keep those uh, parallels of the building parallel on the frame. Whereas a fixed focus 35 millimeter or something like a Hasselblad, you can't actually do that. You would have to tip the camera up. So I'm going to swing around. I'm going to show you my view camera that's already set up. Naturally, it should be very obvious that in order for the back, for the uh, parallels of the building to remain parallel, the back of the camera has to be parallel with the building. So that puts the uh, the challenge in that the the lens doesn't see the top of the building. Well, with the, with a view camera, you have the option. My particular camera has this little rise where you can actually take the lens and move it off center, such as that you see right there. There's a couple problems that happen when you do that. The center of the lens is no longer in the center of the film, which is fine provided the uh, circle of illumination on the lens covers the film. Remember that from the little segments we did in the dark room, the cone of light that shines uh, in the back of the lens. Naturally, the, the, the bigger the lens, the more expensive the lens, the bigger the image circle. So that plays a very important part in covering the, the entire sheet of film. Now, there are other cameras that don't have this feature, this rise feature in the front. So there are ways around that, and I want to show you how to do that. But I want to preface that it's very important that your lens covers the sheet of film so that you don't vignette, as you saw in the, in the videos that we did earlier. So what you can do is you can take the camera, tip it like this, and again, move your back. Remember the back does this. Move the back so that it is now again parallel with the building. Then you take the front lens standard and you make these two planes parallel. So you can see now the lens is higher than the film. That essentially is going to get the top of the building in, um, in, the, in the frame. The problem arises is if your lens does not cover the entire piece of film. So it becomes a balancing act as to just how much rise you can get uh, with the particular lens that you have. These are ways that the view camera accomplishes things that a fixed focus 35 millimeter Hasselblad, something of that nature, just simply can't do. So I'm going to bring the camera back to level. Another part of the view camera that there's little detents in here that actually make it so that it's perfectly uh, centered and parallel so that there's no real guesswork involved. Another real important feature of the view camera is you can alter the plane of focus. And what I mean by that is you can govern what the film sees as in sharp focus because of these movements. But I want to start out by, by um, using this little basket. And I thought of this just the other day. This is a cube. So think of your composition. When you look through the back of any camera, whether it be a view camera or a fixed focus camera, try to determine the shape of the image that you're looking at. And if the shape of the entire image that you're composed is a cube, in other words, height, width, and depth, if it is cube shaped, the only thing you can do to get sharp focus is f-stops doesn't matter if you have the most sophisticated view camera uh, that there is. If the composition is a cube, the only thing you have for sharp focus is f-stops. That's 
number one with this little basket I have. The other comparison I think that this basket can make is the amount of focus that you have fits in this basket. Okay? When you begin to change the relationships of the lens and the rear standard, you only have this much focus. But how you apply it in the composition can change the depth of field and how the depth of field sees the composition that you have. Let me expand on that. So I have the building that's far off in the distance. We talked about the shine fluke rule in the, in the dark room. And the shine fluke rule states, I just want to get this little visual. The shine fluke rule states that when the film plane, you see right here, when that film plane and the lens plane, when those two points intersect, so you have three points. You have the film plane, you have the plane of the ground, and you have this plane right here. When those points intersect, everything is in sharp focus from a millimeter from the front of the lens to infinity. Now, naturally these things can never intersect in a real world. You just your lens can't possibly cover that much. But what you do do is you approach that um, rule or that, that, uh, that physical uh, relationship. So this plane, the ground plane is obviously at a 90 degree angle. When this third plane approaches a 45 degree angle and those points inter intersect, the rule says that everything is in focus from a millimeter in front of the lens to infinity. Now where do you get that focus from? You get that focus from this little basket. You don't have any more. You've just realigned it, you've reproportioned it, however you want to assign um, the act of taking focus from this basket and moving it around. Now, what you can't do when you do this is you can't put something in front that's on the ground that's very high up because the plane of focus essentially goes just like this. As you move away from the lens, the plane of focus goes like this. So right here, close to the lens, you may only have that much height, depth of focus. But the farther you go away, that spreads out. So if you can imagine the space between my camera and that building is, let's just say for the sake of uh, measurements, it's, it's 200 feet, it's 1,000 feet. If I put something, if I put myself in front of the lens, From here up will be out of focus. If I move farther back, then only from here up is out of focus. So it's a cone of focus. The farther you move away from the lens and the film plane, the, the plane of, of sharp focus goes like a funnel. So in reality, when you get to that building that's a thousand feet away, the top of the building will be in focus. But what you may not be able to carry is, if you can see the, the lights stanchion on top of this building right here, more than likely the top of that light stanchion will not be in focus. So it becomes a balancing act as to how you manage to get something that's very close in front of the lens, the, the light stanchion and also the building in the in the background so it becomes it becomes a relationship that you you get comfortable with after and as you go along with with operating a view camera you learn to 
use the seat of the pants for lack of a better uh, description uh, and you understand you know that what this relationship between the ground the film plane and the lens does now we're talking about something that's in a vertical manner straight up and down now you heard me in the in the, uh, in the previous segments of, of the videos talk about not tipping the lens like this unless you absolutely have to the reason for that is the cone of light gets used up at a much faster relationship than if you were to change the relationship with the back. So just to, re, to reiterate what we've already talked about, if you keep the lens plane parallel with the film plane, you're back to a 35 millimeter fixed focus camera. But the view camera has this option where it can rock the back in the opposite direction. That does the exact same thing as tipping the lens this way. Does the exact same thing. The thing you forsake is now the building's lines are no longer parallel. But the good thing is you ha you have you you haven't used up precious circle of illumination because the the lens is still hitting the center of the, of the uh, the film. So many many cameras from years ago did not have a front lens shift it has a rise but they don't have the tilt so it's very easy to still get your building in 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 a parallel manner and the rate the way you would do that is takes a little bit of takes a little bit of trial and error but you would you would essentially rock the back back just as I have here and then you would realign the camera itself so that the back is now parallel with the building. You've essentially tipped the lens forward, but you haven't moved it away from the center of the, of the film, which is critically important, especially with older cameras, older lenses that don't have these big circle of illuminations. It's a, it's a neat little trick that not a lot of people know, and then other people will tell you that well it's very easy it's common sense it is common sense but not everybody utilizes that particular um, feature of the camera so now we've gone over how to get something in sharp focus that's in front such as can you can imagine a, a leaf on the ground in the fall time you want to act you want to accentuate a, a colored leaf or something you'd lower your camera and you'd go through the steps that I just did but you have to understand that that leaf it can be right in front of the lens but if you put something out here you have to understand that this part may not be in sharp focus it may be only in sharp focus till here that's where it becomes a balancing act as to understanding the relationships and what they do and naturally putting them in conjunction with f-stops. Remember now, the Scheinfluge rule says that everything will be in sharp focus from a millimeter in front of the lens to infinity. That's wide open. Now if you incorporate f-stops, 22, 32, something that has some real power to it, you can begin to interact or, or intertwine these capabilities and features of the view camera and get sharp focus from right here in front of the camera, this cone, all the way to the building in the distance. Again, I, I want to stress, it's a relationship that you, that you gain knowledge over time and experience and seeing what works and what doesn't work. The, the, in any kind of photography I've done, the best friend I've had is the wastebasket because I throw a lot of mistakes away that never see the light of day, but I learn from them. And that's the important part. So now that we've talked about how to get the, the building, the top of the building and whatnot in focus, I want to shift to another feature of the view camera. We're going to go over here to this wall.
So what I'm going to show you here is other, another feature of the camera. So this wall is now essentially perpendicular to the to the ground. It's 90 degrees different. Well, the same the same rules apply, but you use different excuse me you use different features of the view camera to to get this part of the wall right here in sharp focus all the way to the end. Let me make this an even more a dramatic example. Let's put the camera right here. So I want right here, this is two feet away from, from the camera lens. I want right here, all the way down there, I want the, the building that's far off in the distance that says the Hartford. That's, that's three quarters of a mile away. I want everything in focus from here to there. How do we do that? We turn the principles that we just learned over there and we turn them 90 degrees. Again, the beauty of the view camera is it has, it has a feature where the rear standard or the front standard can be swung. So the, the terminology used is this is a tilt this is a swing where the camera back swings or the lens can swing. So you can turn the lens like that. But once again, this particular action is nothing more than this, just turn 90 degrees. So what does it do? It uses up a lot of image circle when you do this. So we like to use the back so that we don't use up excessive amounts of illumination. So, so another thing that I that I may have neglected to uh, to, to reiterate continually <clears throat> with a view camera, the image that comes into the film is upside down, and it's also reversed. That's one of the terrific features of a view camera because it takes away the literal um, relationships that you see and it turns it into more of a, a spatial thing but I'm getting off into a, a different tangent so what I want to what I'm trying to illustrate here is the part of this composition this wall that comes onto the film is actually on this side of the, the uh, ground glass it's not on this side it's reversed and it's upside down so think about this if this is the wall that's very close to the lens and you want it in sharp focus, it's re it's play it, it resides on this side of the ground glass. So in order to approach the shine flute uh, principle in this manner, you would take this part of the ground glass and you would move it away from the wall. So you're making it, you're changing the relationship that actually hits the film. You're exaggerating, you're biasing the relationship that hits the films where you're pulling the wall farther away from the film plane and you're actually, in theory, you're pulling what's a half a mile away closer to the film. So this is where it gets into these are relationships I, I've approached the shine flu rule where I pulled the wall farther from the film plane and I've made the building off in the distance and also the end of this wall is now closer to this side of the film so again when you combine that um, ability of the view camera with f-stops you can you can do things. You can pull planes of you can change planes of focus so that it makes your image it steers your image in the, in the direction that you want as far as achieving focus very near and far away. So if if I were if I were going to do this composition, I would take a, 
I would take the camera and I would do more something like this. And I would do the same correction in the back. I would pull the wall farther off the ground glass, away from the ground glass, and I'd put the other, the other end of this wall, as well as the building off in the distance, closer on the ground glass. Now because we haven't done any of this, we're not forsaking any any height. So the height, the the uh, the top of this building, this little wall right here is going to be in sharp focus. Now there are there are times where you may you may decide to slightly pull the back back. So that's called a compound correction, where you've actually swung the rear. Uh, film standard and you've also tipped the rear film standard. There's no quick, there's no real formulas here other than the fact once you gain an understanding of of how these relationships work in real time, real time means you know out in the field applied you know in the field rather than applied in, in a in a graft or a, a classroom type setting. This comes with experience and you know, to think that you're going to be able to apply compound um, corrections the first time out is, is really asking an awful lot um, of yourself. You need to practice. So, just to reiterate, as I did leave out one little thing, just to reiterate, when, you, when you're against this wall and you pull the, the back away from the wall, the closest part, you're going to, you're going to achieve a, the plane of focus that you're after with something that's very close to the wall, to the lens, and something very far away. And just like we saw over with the ground and the cone, what you can't do is you can't put an object three feet, four feet away from the wall and only three feet away from the lens because now this part is out of focus. Let me make it a little bit more understandable. If I'm only this far away from the wall, half of me is sharp and half of me is out of focus. If I step here, all of me is out of focus because the plane of focus is going like this as it goes away from the wall. So it's nothing more than what we showed over there on the ground, the cone, the cone of focus is going like this on the ground, right? Well, when you turn when you turn these principles 90 degrees from the ground, the cone of focus goes like this. So once again, if I'm standing here, maybe only half of me is in focus. If I'm standing here, all of me is in focus. But as I move this far, this farther away, I may be able to stand over here now and be out of focus. So essentially, imagine this. I can do this the farther I get away from the camera and still be in focus. As I get closer back to the camera, I forsake it. And once again, it's a combination of those features of the view camera and also f-stops. This is the first that the the very first, the very first thing I think about when I take the camera out—you heard me say this before—is how can I make a three-dimensional, real, literal scene into a two-dimensional two photograph? We do that with spatial relationship, but that's for another time. The second thing I think about is what does my composition look like? Is it cube-shaped? If it's cube-shaped, the only, the only um, technique I have to increase depth of field is uh, f-stops and we all know that f-stops you know one-third in front of your critical plane of focus is sharp and two-thirds behind is sharp so you apply those principles in conjunction with the features of a view camera and you can come away with images that a fixed focus camera simply just can't do um, one other thing I wanted to say So I have about a 12 inch lens on here. So this, what you see here may be the exact correction that you would use in real life. 
Never do you see, you see these view camera advertisements in magazines where the bellows is almost twisted around like a corkscrew. You never approach those kinds of things in the real world it's simply because the lens can't cover that kind of, uh, um, it doesn't throw that kind of image through. So if you were to change the lens so that it's a shorter lens, let's say you go down to a 90 millimeter lens, something like that. Well then this, this correction becomes much smaller. It's not smaller in the sense, it's only smaller in the sense of how it relates to the front stand. The longer the lens, the greater you're going to see a tip. So I, I want to again thank my video guy Peter Dilag. We've been we've been wanting to to finalize the the whole video cam, uh, the view camera segment, and we've done that. Unfortunately, it's been in a pretty cold morning. So if I've skipped some things or if I've seemed a little out of joint, please send me an email at steve at steve-sherman.com. Be happy to walk you through any kind of problem you might encounter with uh, the view camera and focus and planes of focus and things like that. Remember powerprocess.com. Uh, I can help you with any kind of uh, photography, black and white web process photography uh, related subject you have. Please reach out to me. Thanks for your time.